Hey folks, short video today talking about doping silicon with phosphoric acid and lasers. This is something that I've been interested in for at least a couple years now, and in fact, the very first thing I scanned with the atomic force microscope was one of my earlier experiments with laser doping. It's an old technique that was developed in the 70s and is actually used a fair amount in the solar panel industry, but not so much in the semiconductor chip manufacturing. But despite that, I think it's a really interesting technique that could have some applications for folks wanting to do semiconductor fabrication at home, as opposed to traditional ways of getting dopants into silicon. Now, full disclaimer, this is well outside my comfort zone, which is one of the reasons I haven't really talked about this before on the channel, because I don't really know what I'm talking about all that well, and so I don't want to lead people astray. But it is interesting, and so I'm going to share it, and if I say anything too incorrect, just leave a comment down below and I'll compile an addendum of all the mistakes I made. I should also note that this is not perfected by any means. It's, in fact, just barely working at this point. So there's a lot of parameters to tweak and tune, and what I have right now is definitely not ideal. So keep that in mind. Now the reason that we're interested in laser doping silicon is to get dopants inside of the silicon wafer. And there are a lot better sources on the internet to talk about this, but briefly, dopants are impurities that are intentionally put inside a silicon wafer to alter its electrical characteristics. There are dopants like phosphorus, which are known as N-type dopants, and these impurities have an extra electron compared to silicon. So when you have the silicon crystal with a bunch of phosphorus kind of scattered around, there will be an excess of electrons in that area. And on the other side, there are P-type dopants. And these are chemicals like boron, which have one less electron. And so these are typically referred to as having holes rather than electrons. So places that electrons could be but are not. And when you combine the N and the P in different manners, you get regions that have an excess of electrons here and a deficit of electrons over here in the form of holes, and it allows electrons to flow in particular manner across the wafer. And this is fundamentally how diodes and transistors are fabricated. You combine different junctions of N and P with varying amounts of dopants, and you get your device of interest. So if you'd like to fabricate devices yourself, you need a way to put dopants into the wafer and also put them where you want them to go and keep them there. The classic traditional way to do this is through thermal diffusion. And it's the idea that if you take, say, phosphorus and you put it on top of a wafer and then throw it in a furnace for an hour or two at a thousand degrees, over time the phosphorus will slowly diffuse into the silicon. And this is really great, it's simple to do, it's straightforward, and it works really well. The problem is that, well one, it takes a long time and it needs a lot of heat, so it's not great for industry looking for high throughput. But more importantly, the diffusion process is isotropic, meaning everything diffuses equally in all directions. And that's not great when you're trying to make very small feature sizes because now your dopants are starting to diffuse to locations that they're not supposed to, potentially just hundreds of nanometers away. Today, pretty much every modern semiconductor process uses ion implantation. And this is basically just taking your impurity, phosphorus or boron, and throwing it at the wafer really, really hard. If you throw it hard enough, they'll embed into the wafer and ta-da, you have your impurity inside of the crystal. The main advantage of ion implant is the targeted nature of the process. These particles are flying down in a perfectly straight collimated line, which means that if you put a mask over your wafer, only the stuff that's allowed through the mask will actually implant into the wafer and everything else stays untouched. And there's no thermal process here, so stuff doesn't really diffuse away. So it all just lands right where you want it and you're golden. And so this is something that is much more scalable to the very small feature sizes we see in chips today. Now there are associated other issues. It's heinously expensive. You need machines that are the entire sizes of rooms with dedicated, you know, massive power supplies. It's working with really awful chemicals and gases that we just aren't going to do in a home garage. Although having said that, I didn't think you could do reactive ion etching in a home garage either, and Sam recently did that, so never say never, but probably not something you're going to do in your own garage. And so what that means basically is that hobbyists are pretty much left with thermal diffusion as the only option, except potentially for laser doping. Fundamentally, laser doping is a thermal process. It's just getting the thermal heat input from the laser rather than from a furnace that's just heating everything up together. You have some type of dopant precursor 
phosphoric acid, boric acid, whatever it is you're interested in. You can coat the wafer either with a solid film, or in my case, I use just liquid phosphoric acid right on top of the wafer. And then you drive the phosphorus into the wafer using precise laser pulses. If you get all the laser parameters just right, you will vaporize the phosphoric acid and then melt the silicon underneath it, all within about 100 nanoseconds. That molten layer of silicon will very quickly absorb some of the phosphorus because the diffusion of phosphorus into molten silicon is much, much higher than in solid silicon. And then when the laser pulse is done, the silicon freezes back into place and cools down. And the impurities, the phosphorus, is left stuck inside the crystal and you've introduced a dopant. There's a lot of nuance to this technique. So there's a lot of different variables. The very first one is what laser you're using. I'm using a fiber laser that is near infrared, 1064 nanometers, which is not ideal for this case. The optical penetration of this wavelength into silicon is rather deep, it's like several microns, which means a very large region of the silicon is melted each time a laser pulse hits it. So industry tends to use green or more often UV or eczema lasers because then you can keep the melt zone to just a very thin sliver at the top of the wafer, like tens to hundreds of nanometers. And so right out of the bat, the laser I'm using is non-ideal and you'll always be fighting this line between just not doing anything to the wafer or ablating big craters into it. And after that, there's just a whole bunch of other parameters that all have big impact on the process, like what power are you using? How fast are you scanning? How many passes are you doing? How close are the passes together physically? What's the repetition frequency of the laser? You know, on and on and on. There's tons of different things you can play with, and each of them subtly affects this process. The last major consideration is the thickness of the oxide that's on top of the silicon. And so, all silicon has a native oxide of a couple nanometers, and you don't really have to worry about that too much for this process. But if you grow a thick thermal oxide, like you would in a, a CMOS process, that behaves very differently because the, the oxide is silicon dioxide glass, and it's transparent to the wavelength we're using, which means that the laser pulse will go right through the oxide layer and start to heat up the silicon underneath. And it ends up acting as kind of like a capping layer, where if you don't have enough energy input, you can see the silicon melt and distort and ripple underneath the oxide, but the oxide isn't actually blown off. And so you're affecting the silicon without opening up the thermal oxide on top. On the other end of the spectrum, if you use too much power, then you just ablate away all the oxide, which is great, but then you introduce so much thermal stress into the wafer that it starts cracking or getting large divots and ablation craters, which is not what you want either. Somewhere in the middle is a happy medium where you've stripped most of the oxide, hopefully all of it, and you're left behind a silicon surface that has been melted but not completely churned up. And so this is a really delicate process because we want to melt the wafer but not totally ruin it because ideally we're trying to put some type of you know device on top of this with electrodes and contacts and we need the surface to stay relatively flat. So this is a really fine line to walk uh, which leads to some very cool micrographs, but not necessarily good devices. If you dial the properties in just right, you can find a sort of rippling pattern. It almost looks like water that's been frozen in place. And so if you have a single line of laser pulses, you can see each kind of pulse ripple out behind the next and they all kind of stack up together. If you raster them in a large square or some type of feature, you can see the pulses start to overlap each other. And then depending on the spacing and the frequency and the power, the overlapping is either very regular, so you get a nice consistent kind of wave pattern, or it just turns into this big jumbly soupy mess. And I don't have a good intuition right now of what's better or worse. It might not matter. I'm not really sure. There are a bunch of different ways you can analyze the situations, starting with like a multimeter and going all the way up to secondary ion mass specs. And so what I've been doing is first grab a multimeter and just check the resistance. The wafers that I have are just random eBay wafers, and it turns out they're not particularly highly doped, which means they're not very conductive. They have a high resistance, which 
works out in my favor because it makes it easier to determine if any doping happened. Because if we've introduced dopants, it should lower the resistivity of that section. So with a multimeter, I scratch a corner of the bare wafer to get to the underlying silicon without any oxide and probe that. And then I compare that to the doped region after everything's been cleaned. The wafer itself is in the range of like 20 to 30 kilo ohms. Whereas the doped regions, when it works well, I've seen it as low as 200 ohms. A good result is usually 800-ish ohms. And then more commonly for a lot of the parameters, it's still up in the 7 to 12 kilo ohms. The more definitive test, which is honestly what convinced me that something is happening here, is known as the hot probe test. And this is very simple. You take your multimeter probes, probe the surface, and heat up one of the probes with like a soldering iron, or in my case, I'm using a hot glue gun because, well, long story. But in any case, when you heat up one of the probes, you will see a change in voltage, either positive or negative, depending on what type the silicon wafer is. So for example, if you heat up the positive probe tip and you see a positive voltage, that means you have an N-type wafer. It's been doped with N-type dopants. And if you see a negative voltage, you have a P-type wafer. Now, I know my wafers are P-type wafers because that's what it says on the package. And if we probe the bare silicon of these wafers, we can see that we get a negative voltage, which confirms that this is in fact a P-type wafer. And if we go over and probe one of the regions that we've doped, we can see a positive voltage, which confirms that this region has now been flipped from P-type to N-type because of the addition of the phosphorus. So I think this means we have definitively doped this region. Now, I don't know if we've doped it well, and I suspect we haven't because the electrical properties are kind of all over the place, and the amount of doping is correlated roughly with how much of a voltage magnitude change there is, and that seems to be all over the place for the different tests and trials. But I think it means we have actually doped that part of the wafer, which is pretty awesome. So for me, the next obvious step is to fabricate some type of device to demonstrate this actually works. I've been trying to do a PN junction, kind of the simplest device you can form. You take a P-doped region next to an N-doped region, and that should give you a diode behavior, which you can verify on a curve tracer. And I've had mixed results. My very first test I got all excited about, I probed it with the curve tracer and I saw what I thought was a diode, but in retrospect, I'm pretty sure that was just shot key behavior between the probe tips and the semiconductor, and not actually between the junctions. When I started talking to folks and reading more into it, you need to make sure you have an ohmic contact between the semiconductor and the metal, meaning you need to choose the metals correctly so that the work functions all line up and there's zero or very little resistance between the semiconductor and the metal that you're using to take the reading from. And so the, the probe tips on my curve tracer, I, I think that was just forming a diode in of itself and not due to the junction. So I've been doing a bunch of reading and talking to folks and have settled on using titanium and aluminum for the N-type side and using just plain aluminum for the P-type side and then annealing both of those at 480 some degrees Celsius. And in theory, that should form an ohmic contact to the semiconductor down below. Aluminum is supposed to form good ohmic contacts with P-type just by itself. It can form ohmic contacts with N-type, but it has to be a highly doped N-type, and I'm not sure my doping concentrations, so I didn't really want to risk it. From my reading, there's a paper from 1982, it says that a titanium layer will form a good ohmic contact with the silicon and kind of start to form silicides, and then the aluminum can interface with the titanium, and that's how you can form a good contact. So I've been playing around with this, setting up shadow masks to deposit different test patterns and different electrodes and probing it. And I don't wanna to say too much about it yet because I think the results are no good. I'm still working out the kinks. I've got some stuff that maybe is starting to work. They kind of look like crappy resistive Zener diodes rather than actual diodes. But I think there's a lot of bugs to work out here. And what I'm seeing might just be artifacts of something. I'm not sure. I do think I have a pretty decent ohmic contact on the N-type side. I've set up a little test pattern where I've got electrode, a doped 
n-type region and then electrode, just so I can see the resistance between the two. And if you probe that, the resistance is pretty low, which makes me think it actually is a good ohmic contact going metal and metal. The p-type, interestingly, isn't doing so well. So I have a similar setup just between the bare silicon and two contacts. And its resistance is quite high, which leads me to believe that something went wrong there, and I'm not quite sure what. So all that's to say, diodes not working quite yet, which means I don't really know if this doping is working. I suspect it is, and I'm just running into artifacts of setting up the junction, but not entirely sure, so, you know, disclaimer. So yeah, I think that's where we're at. Like I mentioned in the last video, I'm trying to be a little less precious about my projects and put out work in progress and just let folks see what's happening behind the scenes without it being perfected. I've been toying with this on and off for the last year at least and figured it was probably time to talk about it, at least in some capacity. So when we get to the part of the video where I thank the patrons for their support, it's always like this weird feeling for me because on one hand I, I'm super, super thankful for all the folks that do support me on Patreon and it really helps out keep this channel like alive and running. On the other hand, it feels weird because I don't like asking for money to random people on the internet. I, I don't know, it's just a strange dynamic for me personally. So one of the ways I've justified this is that I have the SEM and AFM archive as a perk on Patreon. You get access to a Dropbox link of all the raw data from the AFM scans and from all the SEM scans. And this is both this channel and Micrographia. And there's like thousands of photos because, I don't know, it's easy to take photos and it's hard to find space to put them in a video. So if any of the things you saw today, the melt ripples, the silicon ablation craters, like whatever, that's interesting and you want it as a desktop background or download it to print out and put on your wall, whatever, that's a perk on Patreon that I thought I'd mention so that I can like give you something rather than just ask for money because that weirds me out. So I think that's all I got for you today. I'm working on the next round of iterations. I've got some ideas that folks have suggested that I'm hopeful will work on the next time and fingers crossed we might get a junction that works sometime in the future. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Wait, wait, wait. One, one more thing. Did you, did you see the hat? Did you see it? Isn't that, isn't that just the funniest hat? <laughs> it's great. I love it. I was down in DC and we were at the Smithsonian and I saw this and like, I need to buy this hat, particularly because it seems like everyone on the internet hates my old hat. And I don't know why. I mean, yeah, it's dirty and falling apart and kind of gross, but like, I've received more comments by people that seem personally offended by this hat than maybe anything else. And it's just funny to me. I like this hat. It's a good hat. But this one, this one might, might start showing up on the channel more. It's a, it's a pretty good hat too. Okay, that's all. Bye. <laughs>